So, Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your holiness. And we thank you that you are drawing us into yourself. And so, Lord, today, may the meditations of our mouths and our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to let you in on a little honest look of the Linden Meyer abode when I was a child. Um, almost every Sunday morning, my mom would yell down our stairs into our room where my brother and I slept, and she would say, wake up, put your church clothes on, we're going to be late for church. And so we would wake up and, you know, I would hurry and I would put my um, clothes on and often we would still be about, you know, 10 minutes late for church. And I know this never happens to any of you guys here. So, um, but I, I would be in my button down shirt and my wrinkled khakis. And to be honest, as a kid, I hated dressing up. I just, I just hated it. And so we would go to church and we would participate and, um, but I would much rather have been outside, you know, I'd much rather have been outside playing football and in my gym shorts and whatever. Um, and, and so many times, even after church, I would go actually and do that. And, and a lot of times I would end up um, ruining some of, my, some of my church clothes. But, um, but I think the truth is that kids don't really care how they look, right? They just, they just don't care how they look or whatever they wear. But, but somewhere along the line, kids start to care about this, right? We start to care about what people think about us and how we look. And then not only do we start to care about what people think of us, but we start to care about what we think God thinks of us. And so we dress up for him, right? We dress up for him as if to hide our nakedness and shame. We make ourselves presentable. But the ironic thing is the more we dress up, the more we hide our true selves from a God who desires to know us intimately and to be connected to us. So the scripture passage that I'm going to read today is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, and it says this. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the, words of, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, you know, in order to put your church clothes on, because that's what we're talking about today, putting your church clothes on, in order to put your church clothes on, the first thing you have to do is take off your other clothes. We're not going to do that today. But what are your other clothes? What are your clothes? And I think the, the reality is that we all wear different clothes, right? For some, it's humor. For others, it's toughness. Um, for me, it's people-pleasing, right? I want people to think well of me. I want God to think well of me. So my mind starts rushing with anxiety and, um, and racing as I start to think about what others are thinking about me. We all have our things, right? We all have our things. But I think deep down, our deepest desire is to be known and loved. So it's actually a little bit sad that we end up trying to be known and loved by putting clothes on, by putting things on to impress. And, and the reality is the opposite, right? Is as we take those off, that's when we are truly known and that's when we experience that love. The show Mr. Rogers, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, would start every episode with Fred arriving home, right? He would, he would get home and he would take off his jacket and he would take off his loafers and he would put on his, his cardigan. He would sit down and he'd put on his cardigan, he'd zip it up and then he'd, you know, he'd take off his shoes and he'd, he'd toss one to the other and, and then he'd put, he'd, put on his, he'd put on his shoes. And I, and I, 
I kind of was wondering about this, and I thought, why? why? Why does he do this when he gets home? And I think it's because at home, he felt at home, right? He felt comfortable, he felt safe, and he felt himself. And not only this, but as he sang his song, Won't You Be My Neighbor?, he was inviting other people into his home, into his safety, into his security, and being, let, allowing himself to be known by that, and hoping that they would experience that comfortability and being known as well. So, though many of us wish our clothes were like those rip-off pants that you wore in, you know, seventh grade for basketball, where you would run out there and you just rip them off and you're ready to play, I think, I think the reality is that sometimes our clothes are hard to get off. And I know this is a silly example, but they're hard to get off, like, like Ross's pants and friends, you know, his leather pants that he couldn't get off or he couldn't get back on, and, and it just seems to be stuck to you, right? Your clothes just seem to be stuck on us. We don't know what we would do without them. It's, very, it's almost a little bit scary to wonder what it would look like. This is painful. In fact, the only way to get them off is to die. And, and earlier in the um, Colossians chapter 3, it says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Surrender to God. Surrender to what God thinks of you. You know, I think sometimes the more we try, <laughs> the harder it is, right? The more we try to get these clothes off, the harder it just seems. You know, we end up like Ross. We just can't get them off. I, I really love Lord of the Rings, and, um, you know, one of the, these kind of pictures in Lord of the Rings is Gandalf. Um, you know, he starts out as Gandalf the Grey in the first movie. Spoiler alert. Just kidding. He starts off as Gandalf the Grey in the first movie, and in that movie, um, he falls to his death, saving the rest of the company. And, and in the next movie, he actually comes back as Gandalf the White, right? Totally renewed. But I was thinking about this moment where he literally surrenders himself to death. He's on that ledge, he's hanging on the bridge, and he just lets go. And I think that is a really great picture of what it means for us. Instead of fighting these clothes and trying to do our best to get them off, what if it just looks like surrendering to God's love instead? So, so what happens when you get your clothes off? Great question. For my two-year-old son, it's usually you start to run around, you know? It's just, I don't know what it does to kids, but when they got their clothes off, it's like, woo, freedom, and they're running around. But I think for us, as you get older, it's a little different, right? When you have your clothes off, it's a vulnerable place. It's a place that we quickly would like to hide, right? There are intimate and sensitive areas where we rarely let others in to see. And I, I hope you guys understand that this is, this is a metaphor. Right? I'm talking about a metaphor here. And I think there's parts of ourselves that we just don't want anybody else to see. But here's the cool part. When we lose ourselves, when you surrender and let go, when you lose yourself in the heart of God, we stop worrying about what other people think or what we think God thinks. And that's the only way you'll discover your true self. So when we're baptized into the divine life, we are drowned in the torrent of God's love to be raised to new life. Your old, worn out, wrinkled clothes you used to dress yourself up and present yourself as, accept as acceptable to God um, have now been replaced by something totally new. You've been clothed with Christ. And the only way to do this has been to become naked. So, in fact, the early church, the, uh, the act of baptism, this is, this is really interesting, the act of baptism um, and conversion and transformation is symbolized with the complete removal of old clothes. So when they were baptized in the early church, they would take off all their clothes 
and they would go out and they would be baptized. And then a lot of times after they were baptized, they would be given a new garment to wear, symbolizing this transformation of old self to new self, of being clothed with, with Christ. Um, you know, even Jesus it's likely that it was, this was the same for Jesus, who came out, uh, who came, who was baptized by John the Baptist, and he came out of the water, and scripture says, at that moment, so here's Jesus, completely naked, removed his old self, his old clothes, at that moment, comes out of the water, and this voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And it says, the Spirit of God descended like a dove. This is your true self. Okay? Clothed in Christ. A child who is loved and in whom he is well pleased. This is the truth of who you are. If you hear me say anything today, please hear me say that. This is the truth of who you are. You are God's beloved child and in you he is well pleased. So I'll try not to get too nerdy um, here, but this is a picture, uh, and it's a representation of the Trinity. It's from a modern artist. Her name's Marlene Schultz. Um, and, and I think this picture really, it, it shows kind of what we're talking about today. And, and it shows the nature of who God is, but also the nature of who's, who he's, he's invited us to be. So in this picture, you have the Christ figure, um, who's also this anonymous prayer, right? With his arms in surrender, his hands open in surrender, his head lifted. And then in the middle of that, you have the Spirit. The Spirit is both dove and, if you look at it the opposite way, fire. And it's received at the heart's point of vulnerability or nakedness. It just says these hands are open right there. And then you have the Father as the everlasting arms reaching down. You can see kind of those arms reaching down. And, and as these arms are reaching down, this circular vortex kind of at the top of the picture, um, the prayer is being caught up in that circular vortex, right? So this downward movement of his arms is thus returned and balanced in harmony by the upward movement. The two being caught up together with the Spirit in the middle of it all. And I really believe this is a picture of what Paul is talking about in verse 14 where he says, above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This is the place where uh, John talks about in John chapter 15, this place of abiding. This is the place of abiding. So as Christ draws us into himself and we start to experience who we truly are, then another realization takes place. We see that he is not just drawing us in, but drawing all things to himself. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and in union with him all things have their proper place. And so we're not only recognize who God says that we are, but we start to recognize that God is saying this to every human heart. And as we are drawn into the life of Christ, we are drawn into one another. God is love, and love binds all things together in this perfect harmony. When I was in high school, I played football. And uh, I know it's like you're looking at me, you're like, really? Did he? Um, I did. Uh, and I, um, you know, on the, on the football team, we would have practice, and sometimes those practices would get a little intense, right? We would, we would be tackling one another, and sometimes fights would break out or something would happen. And, um, and, and so, but when that happened, our coach which I know another coach here, my brother-in-law, who also does the same thing. But our coach would, the, the two people who were fighting, he would make them hold hands and run laps together. <laughs> and so we would, you know, and I, this never happened to me, but it happened to plenty of people on the team. Uh, they would be holding hands and running laps together. And what this did, I think, is it reminded us of something. 
it reminded us that we are on the same team, which I think is something that we need to be reminded of today. We're on the same team. You know, one piece of advice that Kara and I got on our wedding day was to fight naked. Now, I don't know if we've ever done this. I don't re recall that we already did this. Um, but I think the, the idea behind this is that, you know, the vulnerability of seeing our naked selves disarms you in a way that your defenses come down, right? You start, to, you start to lose those defenses, which usually is why you're fighting in the first place. And harmony tends to overcome the derision. In his book, uh, The Shalom and the Community of Creation, the indigenous author Randy Woodley talks about what he terms as the harmony way. This is a way of being in the world where we are uh, connected to God and to others and to ourself and to creation kind of as we were just talking about. And he quotes Walter Brueggemann, and he says this, the central vision of world history is the, sorry, the central vision of world history in the Bible is that all creation is one. Every creature and community with every other, living in harmony and security toward the joy and well-being of every other creature. This description reveals the connectedness of all creation and the resultant harmony and joy that comes by realizing that connectedness. So it's not, this is, this is the point I think I'm trying to make, is it's not just about us being caught up in that, right? It's not just about your, your personal self being caught up in that, although I, I think that's important. But it's about realizing the connectedness of everybody being caught up in that, and how that shifts your perspective of the person next to you, or the person you work with, or the person you don't agree with, or the person you got in a fight with, whatever it is. Um, so why does this matter? You know, I think this is an important question because this seems like a pretty philosophical, theological understanding of this passage, when the passage in itself really does seem pretty practical, right? If you go back and read all of Colossians 3, it's it's pretty practical what he's asking you to do. So why does this matter? As we're drawn into the heart of God, we are drawn into one another, and God who is love binds us together in perfect harmony. And it's from that place of harmony that flows the peace and thanksgiving. Verse 15, he says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. And I think this word peace is actually really important um, in this passage because it's the Greek word irene. And so irene actually means God's gift of wholeness to be tied together into a whole. And so it's much more than just kind of this absence of conflict, but it's really this being tied together as, as a whole. Um, the Hebrew word for this, which probably many of you are familiar with, is shalom. So the Greek word is irene and the Hebrew word is shalom. And shalom is, very, is a very important word in the Bible. It's, it's used over 500 times, actually. And, and a lot of times we don't hear that because we're not hearing this in the original language, so we're hearing words like um, welfare and wholeness and health and um, peace. But it really encompasses all of those things together. Uh, so it's really a cool word. Um, Randy Woodley says this about shalom, and I think it speaks directly to what Paul is thinking about here. I believe our best attempt at understanding shalom says that God's dream is a world in which all creation lives in accordance with the way of shalom. The observation that all creation is connected not only suggests familiarity between all creation, but also expresses tangible and intentional relationships. In such relationships, human beings should make room for the possibility that all creation in some way bears the image of the creator. In other words, there is something of God in all creation. And I would say there is something of us, something of all of creation in God. Living out these relationships as sacred is living in shalom. So we're pulled into the circular vortex of God's belovedness. And it is here that we see the belovedness of all creation. And this is when shalom starts to happen. 
you know, the best way I could think about this, um, and I'm sure there's other examples of this, but I was just thinking of what an orchestra is. And I'm not really a, a music guy, but I've been to an orchestra before. And, um, you know, an orchestra is amazing because there's hundreds of different instruments from all sorts of different families. And yet they're all playing together based on how the conductor is leading them. And as the conductor leads them, they have their eyes on him and they're playing and they're drawn into the conductor and, and, and they're all connected. They're all connected in this beautiful way and as they're playing these songs, these beautiful, this beautiful music, not only are they connected, but they draw those who are listening in as well. And so I think that is a beautiful picture of what shalom is. As, as you're connected to Christ and you realize that you're connected to all of creation, then this beautiful harmony of shalom takes place and it draws others in as well. So going back to your clothes, what are your church clothes? What are your church clothes? Love. Put on love. And what is love? God is love. So put on Christ, which leads to perfect harmony. And as you live in harmony of the divine, God's gift of wholeness, completeness, and belovedness, the beauty of shalom will be what others see and experience. So put your church clothes on. Put on love. As we move to the table, I'm going to, um, I'm going to actually lead us in a little bit of an exercise here. And um, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to just give you a few things to reflect on today. Um, you know, we talked a lot about belovedness and about who God says that you are. Um, but I also understand that sometimes this can be hard to embrace. This can be hard uh, to trust the truth of those statements. And so this morning, as your eyes are closed, um, I just want you to hear these words spoken over you. I want you to hear these words that you are a child of God. That you are loved. and that he is well pleased with you. And I want you to imagine right now him pulling you into his embrace. How does that feel for you? Are you resistant towards his embrace? Are you trying to earn his embrace? Are you still dressed in all of your clothes or are you allowing yourself to be seen and known by him? And as he pulls you into this embrace, I hope that you can experience his comfort and his care. And now I want you to look up from that embrace. And I want you to think about somebody who has hurt you, somebody who you don't agree with, somebody who, um, maybe this is a specific person, maybe it's a, it's a group of people. And as you're thinking about these people, I want you to, look up and see that Christ is embracing them in the same way that he's embracing you. In the same way that he has called you his child, his beloved, the way that he's told you he's pleased. I want you to see that he is saying those same things to that person as well. You're my child, my beloved, 
and you I am well pleased. And as he's doing this to both you and to that person or people group, he's drawing us into himself. And he's drawing us to his table. And as he draws us to his table, he does what he always does. He, he took, takes the bread and he blesses it and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body broken for you. And remember, he's not just saying this to you. He's saying it to everybody. And in the same way, he takes the cup, says, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. He says, drink this cup. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Remember that he has pulled you into himself. And maybe it's this circular vortex that you can just get lost in, that you can really surrender those clothes that you've had on for so long. And as you recognize yourself, maybe for the first time in him, you're also recognizing other people in him and the love that he has for all creation. So as we come to the table this morning, we have uh, these two sections on, on each side and, and you can come up and take uh, a, cup of, a cup of wine and, and a piece of bread and um, as, you, as you think about eating this and as you are maybe take it back to your seat and are sitting with it for a little bit, I want you to think about that person, whoever it is or people group, whoever it is that you saw. And I want you to, I want you to be in harmony with them. I want you to, if, as much as you can, to forgive them and trust that God is pulling you guys together. So let's uh, come to the table this morning. Put on love, put on Christ. And I was thinking about this as you, um, you know, this is something we do every day, right? We change clothes. And so as you're changing clothes this week, I want you to think about that. I want you to think of what it means as you're putting your clothes on to put on Christ. And as you kind of venture out into the world, whether it's your workplaces or your neighborhoods or whatever for Thanksgiving, I want you to practice seeing the presence of Christ in the other as well. You know, I know that Thanksgiving sometimes can be a, <laughs> a tough time of, of family discussion. And so maybe there's some disagreements at the Thanksgiving table and that's a good time to practice seeing that person across from you, how Christ sees them. So... Go in his peace today. Um, if, if you would like, please stay for the chili cook-off. Even if you didn't bring chili, it's all, it's all good. We have plenty of chili. Um, we would love for you to stay. Um, I just went down there. I mean, there's all sorts of chili on the table, so please stay. Um, this is kind of how we're going to do it, just to give you a few instructions. Um, we're going to have sample cups. So you can grab a sample of any of chili that you'd like, and then we also have bowls. So if you really like a specific chili, go grab a whole bowl of that or whatever. Um, and then we're going to give each person, so if you're going to be um, staying with us, we're going to give each person um, three beans, okay? And I know Michael's going to hate me for this because this is how you've done this in the past. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to give each person three beans, and um, you're just going to vote for your top three favorite chilies. And then whoever has the most beans wins. Wins the chili cook-off. So, yeah. So blessings, and I'll see you down there.